questions. Thank you, chairpersons, for that kind introduction. A very good morning to all of you. We know that uh, every individual is special in their own way. But to paraphrase George Orwell, all patients are special, but some patients are more special than others. And by talking of this more special patients, we usually refer to elderly individuals with a host of comorbidities. And that is what I will be looking at today and seeing whether cetagliptin as a gliptin can fit the bill in this population. When we decide an anti-hyperglycemic agent, we look for an agent which is efficacious but carries a low risk of hypoglycemia. It shouldn't have adverse effects uh, that would discourage us from using it. And of course, preferably these agents should be cardio-neutral. And if it's cardio-beneficial, that's an additional bonus. Now, when you consider all these points and when you consider people with comorbidities, that is what we talk of when we talk of use in special populations. We know that choosing an anti-hyperglycemic agent is not rocket science. It's not that complicated. But we need to keep in mind that if we make a wrong choice, it might spell disaster for the patient. So to take the discussion forward, let us look at a representative case. We have a patient, an elderly lady, who has diabetes for the last nine years, is on metformin. She also has hypertension and dyslipidemia, for which she is on an antihypertensive and a statin. She complains of some shortness of breath on walking upstairs. She gives a history of fall in the bathroom leading to a fracture a few years back, suggesting that she has osteoporosis as well. She has some difficulty in reading, is known to have cataract. She is an elderly lady, a widower who lives, who lives alone. Her son lives in a far off land. She's a bit depressed and eats somewhat irregularly. On examining her, her body weight is normal. Her blood pressure is normal. Examination of the eyes reveals that retinopathy has already set in and she has macular edema as well. Cardiorespiratory examination is normal. Examination of her feet are normal as well. If you look at her laboratory investigations, her blood glucose levels are way above normal. Her A1C is at 8.6% and that is why she has come for this consultation. Her lipids need some more improvement. A look at the creatinine is something which we need to keep in mind. This lady has a creatinine of 1.3. It does not look that sinister. But the moment you do an EGFR calculation, you get to realize that she already has developed moderate renal dysfunction, having an EGFR of about 42. So if you look at this elderly lady, what would be the issues that we need to keep in mind before deciding on the anti-hyperglycemic agents that we choose in her case? She is an elderly lady. She needs at least one percentage point glucose reduction, preferably 1.5 percent point glucose reduction. She is at risk of hypoglycemia. She has moderate renal dysfunction, is at high cardiovascular risk, and she also has macular edema and osteoporosis at the same time. Now, talking of macular edema and osteoporosis, the drug which is excluded right away is pioglitazone. We know that pioglitazone on its own is an excellent agent, but it increases the risk of osteoporotic fractures. It increases worsening of macular edema. Another drug which might worsen pre-existing macular edema is insulin. Insulin, of course, is a drug which has no parallel. When you need to use insulin, you need to use insulin. But in those with pre-existing macular edema, it could lead to some worsening. So before selecting on an anti-hyperglycemic for this patient, we need to keep in mind she is elderly, she is depressed, she has renal dysfunction, she, she is at a very, very high risk of hypoglycemia. So agents which cause hypoglycemia, sulfonylureas, the megalitinides, insulin, should not be the first or second or third choice in this patient. Rather, agents which do not cause hypoglycemia should be preferably used in this patient. As we discussed, she has moderate renal dysfunction. Now, when someone has moderate renal dysfunction, it's a compelling indication to use a SGLT2 inhibitor with proven benefit. So we need to put her on a SGLT2 inhibitor right away. And if your EGFR is less than 45, up to an EGFR of 30, you can use only one gram of metformin. If you remember, she was on two grams of metformin. So we reduced the dose from two to one gram of metformin. But what would we do to the glucose control? It would worsen the glucose control further. We add a SGLT2 inhibitor because there is a compelling indication for use of an SGLT2 inhibitor here. But 
given the fact that she has moderate renal dysfunction, how efficacious would an SGLT2 inhibitor be? We know that SGLT2 inhibitors have excellent efficacy and durability, but when your renal function comes down, the efficacy of SGLT2 inhibitor goes down. And just to prove the point, this was a study where in patients, cetagliptin was compared to dapagliflozin, patients who had only mild renal impairment, not severe renal impairment. If you look at their mean EGFR levels, it was around 80. Over a period of six weeks, it was found that there was additional glucose lowering with CETA compared to DAPA in this group. If you took 100 patients with poor glucose control, 15 additional patients reached their targets with cetagliptin compared to dapagliflozin. Now, if you look at the mean EGFR of patients who come to our clinic on a day-to-day -day basis, it's around 80. Just to give you an example, a 60-year-old lady with a serum creatinine of 0 0.8, if you do the calculation, the EGFR will be around 80. And it's exactly in this population where a DPP-4 inhibitor would give greater glucose control than a SGLT2 inhibitor. So in this lady, the SGLT2 inhibitor has to be there for a compelling renal indication, but we possibly need a gliptin to reach our goals as well. And we know that gliptins do not depend on the renal function to show their efficacy. They do not depend on the duration of diabetes to show their efficacy because a good part of their control comes from inhibiting the alpha cell hyperactivity that is there as well. Just to look at an example, in patients who are on insulin, how do you control their glucose levels better? We know that patients on insulin have diabetes for a significant duration. They have already lost some of their beta cells or a lot of their beta cells. So in this, this population, what happens if you upregulate insulin to reach your targets versus if you add a gliptin like cetagliptin to reach your target instead of upregulating insulin? This study showed that addition of cetagliptin gave you greater glucose control at a far lower risk of hypoglycemia and weight gain versus up titration of insulin. Again, proving the point that a gliptin has excellent durability irrespective of the drug that the patient is on, irrespective of the duration of diabetes. Now, what about use of gliptins in renal impairment? There is sort of a wrong notion that only certain gliptins can be used in patients with renal impairment. All gliptins can be used in patients with renal impairment. You only need suitable dose modification. It's just like using an antibiotic, for example, like piperacillin tazobactam in patients with renal impairment, where for a lower dose at a lower cost, you give the patient similar efficacy. And just to prove the case in point, let us look at three different studies three different de degrees of renal dysfunction, mild, moderate, and severe patients on hemodialysis. We know that sulfonylureas are agents which have excellent glucose-lowering efficacy, possibly one of the best amongst the oral anti-diabetic agents. And in patients with renal dysfunction, you can use glipizide or glycoside as the sulfonylurea. Now, this study compared the use of glipizide to the use of cetagliptin in an appropriate dose modification as per the renal status, and found that the efficacy of cetagliptin was as good as glipizide, a sulfonylurea, irrespective of the degree of renal dysfunction, you only had to modify the dose likewise. Now, when we use a drug in renal dysfunction, it's not only the efficacy, it's not only the risk of hypoglycemia, but we need to keep in mind that patients with renal dysfunction have a very high risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, a high risk of heart failure, and a high risk of progression of deterioration of renal dysfunction. And in all these three parameters, if we look at the TCOS trial, which included about 3,500 patients with moderate renal dysfunction, we can be rest assured that cetagliptin does not have any cardiorenal safety issues in patients with renal dysfunction. Now, what about the overall cardiac safety issue? Now, there has been a lot of debate as to whether you need cardiovascular outcome trials or whether you do not need them. But if you have cardiovascular safety proven from a cardiovascular outcome trial, it's always an additional bonus before choosing a molecule. And in this respect, the two molecules which stand out are cetagliptin and linagliptin. With Tenelli and Vilda, we have no such prospective RCT.
With SACSA and alogliptin, we do have some data, but we know that there are still safety concerns with the use of these agents. Now, what about osteoporosis? As we discussed, we, this lady had osteoporosis, and we often get to see a lot of elderly men, postmenopausal women, all of whom are at risk of osteoporotic fractures. If we go back to the TCOS trial, it looked at the risk of fractures and found that cetagliptin did not increase the risk of fractures in elderly compared to placebo. Rather, if you put a number of trials together, 20 different trials together, gliptins as a class could have a, 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 a beneficial effect in reducing the risk of fractures. This meta-analysis of 20 different trials actually showed nearly 60% reduction in the risk of fractures. The prospective mechanism is not exactly known, but we know that there are GIP receptors on the bone cells whose stimulation leads to bone formation. GLP-1 increases the level of calcitonin, which is known to inhibit bone resorption. So possibly there could be an underlying mechanism. We know that elderly individuals are often frail. They have reduced muscle strength, and they are prone to falls. And unless you fall, you can't have a fracture. So when you use a drug like a DPP-4 inhibitor, you have data that they could actually attenuate the decline of mus muscle mass that is seen with increasing age. And by preserving the muscle mass, by preserving muscle strength, it could reduce the risk of falls and reduce the risk of fractures. So when it comes to osteoporosis as a whole, we have good data with gliptins and we have good data with cetagliptin as well. Now the patient that I was talking about was an elderly individual, an elderly lady. If you look at the trials that have, done, that have been done with different antihyperglycemic agents in diabetes, most of these trials, if you look at the trial, they have excluded elderly patients. Patients more than 65 years old were excluded. Patients more than 75 years old were definitely excluded from most of the antihyperglycemic trials in diabetes. Again, if we go back to the good old TCOS trial, about 7,500 patients in the TCOS trial were above the age of 65 years. About 2,000 patients in the TCOS trial were above the age of 75 years, and there was no safety issue whatsoever in the elderly. The other reason why elderly is a special subgroup is that we know that with age, the eGFR starts coming down physiologically. And as the eGFR starts coming down, a drug like SGLT2 inhibitor will start losing its efficacy. On the other hand, a drug like cetagliptin or any other gliptin for that matter doesn't lose its efficacy irrespective of the degree of renal function. Whereas if you look at the data, canagliflozin, even 300 milligrams of canagliflozin, the super powerful oral antidiabetic agent starts losing its efficacy if you consider its use in elderly population. So, it's not only the baseline renal function, but even age which could worsen renal function and cause the SGLT2 inhibitor to lose efficacy. So I would like to make it clear that I have nothing against SGLT2 inhibitors because as I said, in this very patient, the first drug after metformin should be an SGLT2 inhibitor, but it will not help her attain her blood glucose levels. It will give cardiorenal benefits irrespective of blood glucose levels. So the next drug possibly which needs to be added to take care of all these issues would be a gliptin. And of course, cetagliptin would be an excellent choice because if you look at all the issues, none of these issues are a concern with the use of cetagliptin. Now you might ask me, why? what about linagliptin? If you look at all these issues, linagliptin addresses all these issues. So why not linagliptin? I would say yes, even linagliptin would address all these issues, but when it comes to money, the equation is a bit different because we are practicing in a country where money, out-of-pocket expense is a big concern. And if you look at the average price of cetagliptin today, it has come down, the generic versions of cetagliptin. And with the money that a patient could save from simply using ceta instead of lena, the patient could pay for your chamber consultations, could do the laboratory investigations, and of course afford other drugs like a statin, a ARB, and et cetera, et cetera, which would be required for the management of diabetes. Now again, there would be some in the audience, and there would be some who would say that money is not important. When we are talking of life, when we are talking of diabetes management, yes, we, we need to keep science in mind. We, Lena, of course, is a good agent. Why not Lena?
So again, if we look at the universe of evidence, not one or two or three cardiovascular outcome trials, we'll get to see the clear picture. A PubMed search that I did a few days ago shows that articles which have used cetagliptin or have referenced cetagliptin, if you look at the number of articles in PubMed, they are far more than any of the other gliptins. In fact, if you add the publications with all the other gliptins together, they will equal the number of articles that we have with cetagliptin. So this is a time-tested and a science-tested molecule and is approved across the world. And a molecule is good not only when the past is good, but when the future is good. In spite of cetagliptin going off patent, if you look at the number of ongoing clinical trials from clinicaltrials.gov, the number of trials with cetagliptin are more than that of the other molecules, implying the fact that the future possibly is also bright with the use of cetagliptin. Now we talked of an elderly patient with comorbidity. What about young patients? We are got getting a lot of young patients with type 2 diabetes. Now this again is a study from India, from Haryana, from the Army Hospital. Young patients with type 2 diabetes, what after metformin? And here too, a gliptin like cetagliptin outdid a sulfonylurea like glimepiride in terms of overall efficacy and safety in managing glucose control. So finally, we come to the answers that matter. How do we choose a drug? So if we ask ourselves the question, which patient is not a candidate for DPP-4 inhibitor use? It's possibly no one, except for the odd patient, the rare patient with a past history of pancreatitis or ongoing chronic pancreatitis or pancreatic cancer. Every patient is a candidate for gliptin. What is an ad important adverse effect of DPP-4 inhibitor? Again, I would say it's none. Of course, there are cases of arthralgia, cases of rash, and so on, but I think they make for good case reports. They are not very relevant when it comes to day-to-day -to -day clinical practice. And if you ask yourselves the question, which amongst the available DPP-4 inhibitors in India is safe, has a lot of safety and efficacy data, but yet is economical, I would say the answer is very clear. The writing on the wall is cetagliptin. So I would like to end with this very favorite image of mine. This image is from the Syrian war, and it's an ongoing war. So this image is from a couple of years back after the bombing of the Syrian city of Aleppo. This elderly gentleman, his name was Abu Omar, 70 years old. His house was bombed, but he was found sitting on his broken house, on his broken bed, smoking his pipe and listening to gramophone, listening to songs on his gramophone. So this image tells us that even amongst a lot of disturbance around you, you can be an island of tranquility, an island of peace, and the good things in life, happiness, need not necessarily cost you a lot of money. So the analogy here is that even amongst all the disturbance, all the comorbidities and diabetes, a gliptin like cetagliptin gives you excellent efficacy and safety data. And of course, to have an excellent agent on board, you need not spend a lot of money. Your patient does not need to spend a lot of money. Thank you.